Welcome to another Tree of Light pre-concert interview. My name is Oliver Markson. I am the co-artistic director of the concert series, and I'm here to welcome the wonderful soprano Nina Berman. Nina, Hello. welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Nina can be found performing in places like the Alice Talley Hall, the New York Town Hall, the, the Vial Hall at Carnegie Hall, and, and maybe, in fact, in some people's cars, listening to WQXR and, and various other uh, music channels. Uh, but we're very happy to have her uh, coming to, to our concert series in, in Lindbrook. I notice, uh, Nina, that you're somebody who's very uh, eclectic in your output. You're, you're, you're not really staying with one particular niche in the, in the sense that you're, you, you do a lot of leader, you do a lot of uh, chamber music, you do opera, you do choral stuff, and, and even something that is referred to uh, in your bio as neo-psychedelic uh, music. <laughs> you, you'll have to explain that one to me. I'm not entirely sure what that is. Uh, well, I sing with a, a group called the Nels, with a K, the Knells, okay. uh, and this is run by guitarist Andrew Lee, Andrew McKenna Lee, who is originally from Brooklyn. Now he's living up uh, in upstate New York. He's teaching at the College of St. Rose, um, and he was very influenced by a lot of, you know, prog rock, psychedelic rock from the 70s. And so he has put together this group, and I like to think of us as like the, the prog rock Philip Glass ensemble or something. It's it's this group that he's put together and we do exclusively his music. Um, and he has written these sort of epic song cycles that span like an hour. And it's it's three women. I'm the high voice. There are two other women um, in the group. And then our band is, you know, a, a rock band behind us. And it is the coolest thing, the most fun thing. We go and we've performed, you know, at new music venues. We've also performed at you know rock clubs in in Brooklyn and in Baltimore and and so forth so it, it's uh it sort of spans a few different genres and it's super cool right and I would say that having known you for some years uh, at least since our, our student days that uh that it's not the most common path that everyone takes to be able to do so many different things right I mean is, is there something about you you think that uh uh, seems to lend itself well to <laughs> having so many offshoots? Uh, you know, I think these things are more similar than you might realize, right? Because um, this prog group is very new music-y. There's a lot of crossover and I sing a lot of new music and I think you'll find, I'm sure you found this yourself, a lot of singers who do new music also have a foot in early music. Um, and, you know, you get early music people doing leader and early opera. I mean, there, there are so many similarities between all of these genres. So um, there's maybe more overlap than meets the eye. Yes, yes. Well, it's certainly, it's easier in this time maybe to, to have crossover between different genres than it used to be. Uh, it used to be that you're really just one or the other. Uh, and now you can just, so I, I also noticed that you're somebody who does a lot of uh, contemporary music and, and you've actually premiered a lot of, of uh, music by composers who are quite prominent now. Um, your husband is a composer. I, I wonder yes. if you wanted to say something about his music. Uh, well, he is a minimalist, a post-minimalist, um, if that means anything to you or anyone who is listening. Um, I premiered a piece of his in 2018, which was a really big sort of epic song cycle that was a lot of fun to sing. Um, I did that with Steve Beck. And uh, Steve actually just gave two premieres two weekends ago at Barge Music of his, um, which was nice. Um, his music is sort of think, uh, I don't know, David Lang meets Philip Glass meets Steve Reich sort of, does, does that mean anything? I have a, an interesting picture in my head. <laughs> <laughs> what it does for those listening. Yes, yes. Uh, so I, I think he's um, quite a talented composer. And 
the the strain um, of music that he's most interested in is not something that I've typically been interested in myself and through our relationship and through um, listening to his music and singing his music, um, I've discovered so much more value there than I previously thought there was. Right. Well, that's a wonderful way to actually acquaint yourself with something. Yes. Uh, so I think the last time that you and I collaborated was probably about six years ago, maybe seven years ago. Some time ago, uh, yes. Yes, I think it was the Bohemian National Hall. Um, the Ah, uh, yes. The Lutoslavsky, yes. Was it Lutoslavsky? I, I had that yeah. completely wrong in my mind. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say Ligeti, but uh, of course the, it wasn't Ligeti. It, was it wasn't. You're absolutely we, we right. We considered Ligeti. We did something else instead. <laughs> What we have, at, at least at any rate, in this uh, program that we're just about to do is is now coming back to the extremely conventional classical literature. Um, do, do you have any preference in terms of the things that you do, or is it a sort of anything goes kind of attitude? Uh, do, do you have a particular fondness for certain types of repertoire? Uh, well, I, I certainly do. I mean, you see, I sing, you know, I sing a lot of Babbitt, um, which I, I love. Um, and I, I love doing new music, but also Schumann is one of my favorite composers. Uh, so I've sung uh, this particular song cycle many times. I keep returning to it. Uh, I, I love Schumann. I'm, I'm sure you do as well. I mean, you you are the one who suggested this cycle. So, um, <laughs> yes. That's my impression anyway. Uh, yes, yes, I won't own up to it, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. It, it, what what do you feel about this program overall that the Schumann and the Strauss and the Schubert combined? Well, um, this is one of those programs, right, of, of music that is sort of well-worn. And um, we have the privilege to look at it and, and do something wonderful with it. And the Schumann particularly, I think, is just such open, innocent, um, marvelously imaginative uh, music. A and um, it's always somewhat, I don't, I don't know if you agree, but somewhat like, um, you ever seen one of those handmade doll houses that's, that's really big and uh, you go and visit it again and again. And each time you, you visit this doll house, you discover there's like another little bow here on, on the bedspread that was put there. Or um, there's, you know, look, look how lovingly the broom is leaning against the tiny little broom leaning against the, the kitchen door or whatever it is. There's always something um, exciting and, and fun and creative to discover uh, even when you have done it a million times. And it feels real. It's so earnest and creative and, and imaginative. Um, is that making sense? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I, I think I, I'm currently I'm working on the, the Carnival by Schumann. Ah, yes. Which is, I mean, it's something as I've lived with many years, but again, it's individual characters, almost like a dollhouse, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm reminded of a, a phrase once uh, uttered by the great pianist Edwin Fischer when he's describing Mozart and saying that you know, what, what we have in Mozart operas is the opportunity to ascend to the level of gods that look down on people and you see comedy and tragedy mixed into one moment and uh, and you can laugh and cry uh, in the same moment because of that uh, yes. and it's something like that it's this sort of and you look down with with love i mean it's not yes. looked down in any sort of uh, well, of course of course i i know exactly what you mean i i completely i completely agree with you i think that's maybe why i think of of a dollhouse right because it everything is sort of at a smaller scale and you feel large and you get to see everything for what it is um and we get to go back time and time again to these pieces and nothing really ever changes but it feels new anyway and it feels fresh anyway and there's value and joy right in returning to those same nooks and crannies over and over again even though you know what's there you know what's around the corner right yes and, and I mean as far as returning to certain themes that there seem to be certain immortal themes uh, let's just say in 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 I would say in the life of a woman but certainly in, in anyone's life that 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 is uh, revisited in this kind of music that uh, what what we've got with this program is, 
I, I don't know whether we thought of it that way, but it, it's somehow we've got two experiences of two very different women. Yes. Uh, and I mean, they're both sad, but but one is sort of joyously sad, I would argue. I don't know if you agree, but the other one is just completely devastating and miserable and and tragic uh, and not very much more than that. And, and when I, of course, up there, I'm talking about Ophelia. Yes. yes. Um, so I don't know, have you paired these two works in programs before? Uh, I haven't, actually. This will be a, a fun, a fun adventure, I think, because they're so different, right? The, the Schumann is such a substantial work that uh, sort of spans, well, I guess her, her life with her husband, so not her whole life, but, but her, her relationship with her husband. Um, and then the Ophelia leader, it's like this, um, it's like a wisp of a song cycle. Do you know what I mean? It sort of materializes out of thin air and then, and then uh, just disintegrates back whence it came. And it's so packed uh, with so much experience and then boom, it's out like a light, just like Ophelia. Um, it's, it's so interesting. Uh, I guess I'm not saying much that, that you haven't already just said, but. Um, not, not at all. I mean, it's, it, it's interesting about the, the uh, Ophelia um, verses that are used for, for this uh, cycle, because it, it's, it's just in that moment, basically after she loses her mind. Yes, it's, it's um, a mad scene, right? Over the course of three songs. Yes. And, so I mean, in, in the original play, that that in essence, it it wouldn't be so interesting if if it's just okay. Now she's lost her mind, and I'm going to say a bunch of stuff that doesn't make any sense. It has to have some truth to it in the midst of things that might sound crazy to those around her, mm -hmm. um, and and that I, I think that Strauss is also fascinated by and playing with that kind of these elements of truth that are in there. And she's speaking more elements of truth in, in those few verses than she has in the whole, you know, uh, run up to that that section in, in, the, in the play. Certainly. He sets it so well, huh? I mean, it's just, uh, it's just amazing, right? I mean, it's such a weird cycle, isn't it? It's super weird. I, I, I mean, it's not contemporary music, obviously by any stretch, but it's 1918. So, I mean, Right, that's that's a long time ago, uh, but <laughs> it, is. Uh, it feels fresh somehow uh, in 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 a particular way. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I, I think. I mean, it's it's interesting how you can have something that old, which seems so daring even now. Yes, and um, it, and it, it it is something which also I find is actually quite underrated uh, as as a vocal work. It's not something that I. I there are quite a lot of vocalists that I've talked to about that and they say, what, Ophelia? I don't know that work. Um, and I think it's a masterpiece actually. And I mean, it's, it's not the, the only time he's done a, a sort of programmatic theme around somebody slightly warped in their thinking. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Don Quixote, of course. Sure. Uh, so she, she, she's kind of going off and reminiscing about this and that. And there's a wonderful bit in the, the third movement in particular about that. These are, warhorse sort of pieces. Um, everyone knows them. And I think uh, for the two of us, um, we certainly have quite a task ahead of us, right? We need to turn them into something fresh and full of imagination and, and truth and earnestness. And um, that's hard to do when there are so many other voices echoing around right when you have all of the great performances sort of sitting right right here uh yes for me anyway um that's it, it's awfully hard sometimes to to find a, a real a real voice because it should be this way or that way and these pieces have all been performed a, a thousand times I, I mean thousands and thousands of times by you know some of the the greatest singers and and pianists and, and also terrible singers and pianists but it's all <laughs> yes. it's all you know it's all it's all part of the the conversation and these performances talk back and forth to one another and we sort of need to find a way to do something with them uh to just say something 
yes, that's kind uh, of pop out of an answer, but. Not at all. I mean, I, I feel the same thing very often, um, particularly when it comes to classic repertoire. And yeah. it's, it's just the feeling that you've got the weight of, you know, a hundred great artists and their performances uh, that are preceding yours. So what has it been like for a singer during the last two years uh, with the pandemic? Um, well, it's been the same as it has been for lots of other people, right? It's been exhausting and frustrating um, and, and awfully quiet. Uh, I haven't been doing much singing at all. Uh, I only did, I did one performance and I think I did two recording sessions and that was it for the entirety of, of of the pandemic, so um, it's been it's been awfully frustrating, um, and I feel out of shape, and uh, I feel like my soul has kind of died a little bit, as I think all of us have felt. And so um, it's wonderful to to be back to it um, with with these pieces. Um, it's like medicine it's like bomb for the soul uh it's so healing to be able to sit down and and work on something um and feel that there's an end goal here and to feel that i'm getting to say something and getting to do something and and you've had this series going for some time now right so you've continued to perform throughout is my understanding we've had some i mean it's not not all the way through. Sometimes we just couldn't do it at all. Um, mm -hmm. But we were blessed by the fact that it, the venue is a church. And so at least for regular churchgoers, they see that there's a certain protocol of social distancing and temperature checks and um, masks and everything. So it's uh, that they, they were encouraged to come uh, under those circumstances and only under those circumstances. Um, but suffice to say that, you know, I mean, in your case, I'm sure you're not only do you miss your audiences, but your audiences miss you. And <laughs> it's uh, the, the, the whole in everybody's heart isn't just in terms of what they're doing, but there have to be live events, uh, you know, not, not, not at the expense of safety, but they do have to be, uh, it is, it is a general necessity of, of human life. Sound bite answer. Yeah, I don't know that I, I'm not good at sound bites. I my I'm just a talker. My mom would say a, a gum flapper. Um, so <laughs> yes, that's. I mean, I, I I'm I'm not good at sound bites either. And yeah, yeah. how is your mother? Well, she's she's okay. She's okay. Um, you know, hanging in there. We're all hanging in there. I think so. This is this is a great question to finish on, right? Yes. How is your mother. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, it's been wonderful chatting, and uh, I'm really looking forward to to first of all rehearsing, and uh, yes. secondly, uh, putting this stuff together live for the audience. Uh, so, thank yes. you so much for being with us today. Yes, this will be a lot of fun. Um, can't wait to get to it. All right. Looking forward. Good.